All right, everyone. So um, good afternoon um, and uh, welcome to the to the fun part. Uh, this is the most most fun day of the year, obviously, where we're going to talk about you know, <clears throat> all the nice and, and cool things that we have been, been building in DHS2 over the over the last year. So in in uh, in this presentation, uh, we're going to try to be um, a little bit interactive. And we're going to have a lot of questions. So you can choose to go to the annual, uh, sorry, the community of practice um, and find the annual conference um, sort of uh, community there. And you can look for the what's new in DHS2 thread uh, <clears throat> and, and ask questions there. Uh, you can also type um, questions right into the Zoom chat, and we will try to moderate and, and gather some of the questions. Um, Scott Prospatrick is joining me for this session, and he will be uh, moderating the, the questions. And we will try to answer some of them in the last um, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, if you don't get time, we will also, of course, try to answer those questions um, directly in the community layer. All right, so with that, let's let's jump straight to it. So today, we're going to talk a bit about all the cool new things within uh, analytics uh, and tracker and platform. Um, we're not going to touch on Android. There's going to be a session uh, later for, for Android, so you can stay tuned for that later uh, and later in the day. So in this session, we're going to focus mostly on sort of what's new in the, um, in the 233, 234, and 235 releases. Um, obviously, we're going to have the 235 release coming out in about um, two weeks. And I'm going to demo. I'm going to be very uh, adventurous and demonstrate from the development branch today of the software, so that you can have a quick look at all the new goodies that's coming out in uh, in a couple of weeks. Of course. All right. So let's take a quick step back and look at what came out in in 234. So one of the biggest things we did in 234 was what they call pivot tables in the Visualizer app. So uh, previously we had a sort of separate uh, app for pivot tables. And in 234, uh, we managed to <clears throat> sort of integrate that straight into the uh, visual data visualizer app. And the benefit there is, of course, that there's now there's, there's one app to deal with. We don't have two apps that people have to learn. There's just one. Um, and uh, the pivot table is essentially integrated as a new visualization type within directly within the, the data visualizer, meaning that you can easily switch back and forth uh, the, the different types of visualizations. Um, the pivot table is a lot more scalable now. Uh, you can load at least three times more data into the pivot to avoid these types of out of memory uh, or browser crashes um, that we have seen previously. And um, this also comes with uh, what we think is a very important little feature. We call it the dimension recommendations. Uh, and this is a nice little thing. So let's have a, let's have a quick look and, and see how this works. So we can start by going to the um, data visualizer application. And uh, as usual, we can now, we can pick a couple of uh, data elements if you want to do that, as we always do. Um, by default, this is now rendered as a chart. The nice thing is that now we can go to the uh, top left um, visualization type selector and we can just select pivot table. So pivot table is just another visualization type together with column and stack column and bar and area and all these other uh, visualizations, which is quite nice because then it, everything is integrated in one place to go. Um, we can go here and pick some more organizational units if you want. Um, and we can say update. Uh, we can drag organist down here. Uh, we can load and, and so forth. So this is now just another visualization type within the data visualizer. We also, get, if you look closely, you will see these nice little green dots here on the left side. And, and the green indication is essentially uh, what they call the recommendations for dimensions. So, so if you have selected certain data elements, this will basically recommend which dimensions are relevant for the data elements that you have selected. Um, and this should resolve some of the problems we see where people select data elements and then they don't really understand which categories uh, and group sets sort of align with, with those um, data elements. So, so that, that should be a helpful uh, feature. All right, so in 235 and 4, we actually did a lot of new improvements on the visualization side. So there's a lot of new options available now for, for charts and visualizations. Um, and the first one is what we call the dual axis charts. So <clears throat> many people have come to us and say there's a problem when you try to, for instance, convert things which have different units of scale 
So one, one very good example of this would be what we call when we try to combine data elements and indicators, because obviously like percentages and, and, and raw numbers don't really look very nice on the same chart. So let's have a, let's have a quick look and see how, how this works. So <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to select a couple of um, indicators. So I'm picking two indicators um, and I'm going to create a quick chart. This looks nice so far. Um, then I'm going to go and pick a couple of data elements. So we have A and C, one, two, three. This is, we have both indicators and, and raw data. Um, this doesn't look so good anymore. We now have the percentages down here and the raw data up here. And the chart is not very useful. useful. So to handle this, we can now go to the options and then the uh, series dialog. So we have a new series dialog within the options. So here I can come and say, okay, I now would like to select uh, some of the data uh, series, some of the data items I have selected and put it over on another axis. So we can see here that we have X is one, two, three, four. So we'd now support up to four axes. So I picked a couple of days uh, and we can now see that the chart is immediately more useful. We can now look at um, both day element indicators in the same chart like this. And we can see that we have a secondary axis over here on the right together with the regular first axis on, on the left side. And the colors also align nicely to the, to the axis. Um, another very sort of popular feature request we had is what we call combination charts, the ability to combine different types of visualizations in the same chart. Uh, because you sometimes would like to have both lines and columns, for instance, in the, in the same chart. So to demonstrate this, we're just going to continue with the same example. So if you go to options and back to series, we can now see that we also have for each series data item, there's a visualization type. So we can say that uh, for these data items, I would like to use a column. Um, and for this, I would like to use a line. So, so far we only support column, uh, uh, sort of column and lines, but we, we plan to add more in the future. So I can click update. Uh, and we can now see that we can combine both uh, columns as well as lines in the same chart, which is quite nice. And this is also very flexible in the sense that you can, you can select exactly which data item you would like to have as a line and which one uh, to have as a column. All right, and we also talked about this one now already. Uh, we have a series management dialog that we just looked at, uh, which is quite handy where we can select both the axis to, to put the data item as well as the visualization type. So all this can be controlled in the same chart. All right, um, another very popular request was the ability to have two categories on the same chart. Um, because sometimes you would like to have more than just one category. You could have, for instance, two categories uh, and you would like to have those to displayed in the same chart. Um, and if you look very closely on the screenshot, you will see that we have um, facilities or actually districts coming down on the, on the lower, um, category down here. And then we have uh, what, this, what we call uh, quarters up here on the, on the sort of upper category. So districts down here and uh, quarters up here. So, so let's have a look and see how we can do this. This is actually very simple um, because we have this nice drag and drop area up here where it's very easy now to, to select different things. So let's, let's build a quick chart. Um, we can select some indicators. Um, we can select, let's say, last four quarters. Um, and then we can pick, let's say, three different districts like this. Um, and now I can very easily just drag my districts down on the category. Uh, I can click update and it shows me a very nice chart where I have the quarters up here and then the, the different districts down here um, on the lower um, category axis. And the cool thing is that I can also now continue to add filters, of course. So if I would like to say, you know, facility ownership, public facilities, I can add this to filter. Um, and then of course, I'm only going to show public uh, facilities like this. So we can now add more information into the same, into the same chart. All right, moving up. So the also um, added the ability now to have multiple color sets per chart. And, and many people have come to us and say, um, they would like to customize the colors that you see in the chart. Um, so far, we only had essentially one color set and there was a need to add more. And so far we have added, uh, I, think, I think five or six um, color sets. So let's see how it looks. I'm gonna reopen, um, 
chart. I'm going to go to options. Um, it's style. And down here, we now have uh, a, a heading called color set with default bright, uh, dark gray. We also support uh, patterns and also colorblind optimized um, color sets. And this is to optimize and support people that have, you know, uh, seeing disabilities or colorblind uh, to make it easier to see. And also to, for, for printing purposes. Sometimes when you print, it, it's easier to have these kind of patterns or kind of more contrastful uh, colors. So if, if I change to bright, um, you can see now that everything changes to a, to a brighter uh, color set. You're also open to adding more, of course, here. So if you have specific needs for, for specific color sets, uh, we're open for including more of these uh, going forward. Okay, um, another one for visualization, text styling is another one that's kind of very common and something you see in most BI tools out there today. So we also have added this. Um, so we now have the ability to style the text, both in terms of the application, uh, the chart title, subtitle, uh, the legend, the horizontal axis, the vertical axis. So if you look closely here, you can see that uh, the title is bigger than it usually is. We have uh, italic on the subtitle and so forth. Um, so again, this is very easy to, to use. So we can know the chart. Um, we can go to options, style. Um, under axis, there's also the ability to customize the vertical axis, horizontal axis. Um, under style, we can change the legend key. We can say, OK, I want a bigger, bigger legend key. Um, for the title, I would like to make that extra large. I would like to make it uh, bold. I can also change the color if I want to do that. Um, subtitle, uh, we can say, we can add a custom title. Uh, we can make it large and italic. Um, and then they reload, they can see that the, the title is bigger, um, it's bold, it's going to be italic. So we plan to make this even bigger uh, by the time of the 235 release. All right. Um, we also made improvements on the gauge charts. So the gauge charts is maybe, uh, maybe a little bit underutilized, but we have and I'll try to make it more useful now by adding a few things such as support for legends and also target line and, and baseline. So what I mean, what I mean with legends is essentially that um, the color will change based on the value. So uh, as you know, like indicators in DHS2 can have um, legend sets, meaning that you know we can have red for poor performance, green for high performance, or, or orange like this one for medium performance. Um, and so forth. Uh, and if you select an indicator, you enable legends, you can now see that the, the color of the gauge chart will change um, as we as you move. We can also set the baseline and the target line, and it will show, like you can see here on the on the slide, where the, 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 the different lines uh, become visible on the gauge chart. So this is a very effective way now for uh, making the gauge chart more useful. If you have kind of key indicators, key performance indicators, uh, you can easily display these now as, as gauge charts. All right, so switching gears a bit. Uh, this has been there for a while now, but um, I think in 233 or 4, we added the ability to add filters to a dashboard. And this was also a very kind of a top request that came from many different people. Um, and this is nice because it allows you to do cross uh, dashboard item filters. So it applies to everything within the dashboard. Um, we also removed the restriction to not just have relative periods in what we call user organizations, but uh, you can now also have fixed periods and also select explicitly the different organizational units. So let me show you quickly how that works. So if we go back to the dashboard, uh, we can navigate quickly back here. Um, so when the dashboard loads, uh, we can see now that there's a <clears throat> new button up here that's called Add Filter. So we can decide to add the filter. And here, the cool thing now, in the, in the first release, we just had period and organets. Uh, we now have also what we call your dimensions, which are essentially uh, custom dimensions. So we have any type of dimension can now be used as a filter for this um, dashboard. So, if I would like to apply, let's say, a, a period filter, I can simply come here and I can select, select both fixed periods as well as relative periods, so both of them. Um, if I, I can also go to organet uh, and I can choose to, do, to select an organet to override for the filter. Um, and I can, of course, switch between user organets and explicit organets. 
Um, I can also select dynamic dimensions. So let's say I would like to say, okay, again, I only want to look at public facilities. I can say confirm. Um, and we get this little, um, you know, box up here that indicates that public facilities have been selected as a filter. And the cool thing now is that the dashboard is going to re-render uh, with data only coming from public facilities. And of course, you can have any number of filters going into this dashboard. All right. Um, another big one was what we call single value dashboard items. Um, and this is quite popular. You see this in many other tools that for, especially for key performance indicators, people would like to have like uh, one big number straight on the dashboard to indicate kind of key performance, key metrics for your country or organization. Um, and the way we implemented this was essentially to introduce a new visualization type that uh, appears in the data visualizer. So <clears throat> in the visualizer, we can uh, go here. Um, we can, it's easy to set up. You just pick one indicator. Uh, and then you say, okay, I would like to have a single value as the visualization type. I click update and it comes like this. I can save it as a favorite and put it on the dashboard as any other uh, sort of visualization if you want. So just another visualization type that you can include straight onto the dashboard. All right, um, another very popular request has been the ability to print dashboards. So, you know, people build beautiful dashboards um, on, on VHS2, and then they would like to essentially uh, download to PDF so that they can print it uh, or distribute uh, sort of soft copies on, on email or Slack or whatever they want to use. So if you come to the dashboard now, there's a, there's a print button that will open it it's in a print-friendly uh, format. And then you can use the sort of native uh, print functionality of the browser to uh, print it to, to PDF. So again, very simple to use. Uh, we go back to the dashboard. We can maybe remove this filter. Um, you come here, you say print, and then uh, maybe you need to let the dashboard load first. <clears throat> Just a few seconds. We say print, and then you can choose between the dashboard layout or one item per page. So dashboard layout will try to follow the uh, layout as you have it on the dashboard with potentially multiple items on the same horizontal uh, line, while one item on per page will do, as it says, put one dashboard item on, on each page in the print. Uh, and from there, it's easy to, to you know, save this PDF to the browser and, and, and download it to your local computer. All right, so switching gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about the sort of uh, aggregation logic in the system. So another very popular request has been um, the ability to compare time periods in indicators. So up to now, um, indicators really only works on the, what we call the aggregation period. Um, and with aggregation period, what I mean is the period that comes into the analytics API, the engine. So if someone requests data for, let's say, quarter uh, three in, in 2019, the system will calculate the indicator and return data for quarter three 2019 period. Um, in 235, we now have the ability to introduce what we call period offsets. And period offsets essentially means the ability to go back or go forward X number of periods relative to the aggregation period. So it allows you essentially to compare time periods within an indicator formula. Um, so this means when you define the indicator, uh, you, can, you can do as you see here on the slide, you can, you can define a data element or an option combo, and then you can say dot period offset minus one, minus two, minus three, three or just plus one, two, three. Uh, and this is essentially going to rebind or forward relative to the aggregation period that came into the query. So one example where this can be very, very useful would be in logistics, where we can easily calculate now consumption of commodities. So for instance, we can create an indicator that looks at the, for instance, the stock levels. We can say, okay, I would like to know how much stock, what was my stock level, you know, three months ago? How, how much was it two months ago? Uh, and then I would like to compare that with how much stock on hand I have for this month. 
And by doing that, we can easily calculate the consumption and then we can calculate sort of your stock on hand, like for, for how many months do I have stock on hand before I, I get a stock out. Um, other use cases would be what we call trends uh, and differences between this and last period. So we can easily, you know, do the calculation of how do we perform this, this month versus last month. And we can, we can actually then present some kind of indication of it, are things going, going, getting better or are things getting worse. And then we can combine this with, let's say, legends um, and, or charts, and then we can very easily display uh, whether we are improving or things are getting worse. Another use case would be progress against targets, of course. So if you enter targets in the future, we can also then easily compare uh, your current performance against, against the targets that, that entered, for instance, for, for next year. So we think this can really help teach us too uh, and make it more feasible, especially within uh, LMIs um, and logistics. All right. Um, another big one that we did in 234 was what we call real-time analytics, um, also known as continuous analytics. Um, and historically, DCS2 has had kind of a weakness in the sense that very often uh, the data that you enter does not become available for analysis um, until the next morning. So the, the, the normal way of doing things would be that people enter data during the day, and then we have the analytics tables run during night. Um, and then data becomes available in analysis uh, the next morning, essentially. So in 234, we have a new solution for this that we call continuous analytics, or also known as real-time analytics. Um, and this allows you, this kind of functionality uh, does not rebuild the entire analytics tables, but instead it only looks at the latest data that has been entered. So instead of doing the complete update of analytics tables, it only does the difference, the data that was entered uh, essentially since yesterday, um, since last time you ran full analytics. Um, this can be configured in seconds. You can, you, can you can configure the number of seconds to kind of wait in between these updates. Uh, and since it only looks at the diff, like the difference since last time you ran full analytics, it's much quicker. So we think that on, on small systems, the, 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 the kind of delay between data entry and analytics now can, can get down to the seconds. Um, on larger systems, it's probably down to a few minutes. So we have seen, you know, two, three, four, five, six minutes, something like this. But in any case, it's going to make the, the diff between data entry and analytics much, much shorter. Um, this can be configured as a, a <laughs> new job in the, the scheduler app. So if you go to scheduler, there will be a new job type <clears throat> that they call uh, continuous analytics table. So you need to probably disable uh, your existing analytics table job, and then you can create a new one for the job type called continuous analytics table. Um, as you can see here, you can give it a name, uh, delay in seconds. That refers to the kind of waiting in between the different runs of this job. And then there's something called full update hour of day, which means at what, what time do we run the full update? So it still runs the full update once per day. Uh, and this you can schedule to run, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., midnight, whatever. All right. So switching gears a bit, uh, let's move over to the Maps application. So when it comes to Maps, uh, we also have a lot of exciting improvements there. Uh, Bjorn and Austin and the team have been doing really, really good work. Uh, and we have tons of improvements on the, on the Maps application. Um, first, a couple of them. Uh, we have, first of all, have much faster rendering now. We're using WebGL, uh, which is technology that essentially allows you to use more of the hardware accelerated graphics. So it, it uses the, the hardware of your machine much better than previous plain JavaScript libraries. Uh, and this has resulted in much faster rendering of maps. So it looks much faster now. It runs and, and sort of renders much faster than before. Um, we also have much more seamless zooming. So when you zoom in, we don't have these huge gaps in between each zoom level, but it's much more smaller levels now, which appears as, as what we call seamless zooming. Um, we also have added support for Bing Maps as the base map. Um, we had a little bit of trouble with Google Maps as they now require credit cards and it's not free anymore and so on and so on. And so we decided to switch over to Bing Maps uh, and we now have full integration of Bing as the, the base maps, both uh, satellite imagery as well as uh, street view. Uh, we also had a little support for what you call the full screen mode. Uh, so essentially, if you click F11 now, uh, you will see that uh, 
we go into a full screen mode, which is very, very useful for things like presentations. We also plan to add this to the, to the data visualizer app. So let's, let's head over to the Maps application and, and see how things are improving over there. So, so we can go to Maps. Uh, I created a little favorite here um, where I can open and just to demonstrate the performance gain. So as you can see here now, uh, things are loading quite, quite fast. So that was loading a map with, uh, I think, 30, 40 something uh, uh, chieftains in more than 1,000 facilities in, in less than a second. So we can see that things are loading fast. Uh, scrolling is also much smoother, as you can see. We don't have these huge gaps. It's very smooth and nice. Uh, we can change the Bing. So we're looking now at the Bing sort of street view or, or roads, as they call it. Uh, we'll have the, the Bing dark view, uh, which can be nice for certain types of maps. Uh, we, have, we have Bing aerial, meaning sort of satellite imagery maps, and also with, with labels. So this is, is nice, nice and fast. Um, one major improvement that's coming out in 235 is what we call bubble maps. So previously, when it comes to thematic maps, um, we essentially only had the ability to render uh, and display values using colors. So what I mean is essentially coloring the different polygons for, for the map, such as districts and chieftains. Um, when it comes to um, data, which is not percentages or coverages, um, it's sometimes more useful to look at bubbles to indicate the size or number versus just a color, because it gives you kind of a stronger uh, visual of, of the situation. So let's have a quick look and, and see how this works. So I'm just going to load uh, an existing map that I have. Uh, I can change to a data element. So I can decide to look at, I'm just going to pick a data element here. <clears throat> so as you can see now, like these maps are not really that great sometimes, right? If you have super high values and some low values, it becomes kind of tedious like this. It doesn't give you a, the full picture. Uh, we can, of course, come here and say, okay, I want to go from equal intervals to equal counts. That makes it a bit better. Uh, but now I can also go to style and I can say, okay, I would like to change to a bubble map as, a, as opposed to just a coral plath map. So coral plath map essentially means colorize the polygon. Bubble map now will change to displaying as bubbles. Uh, and now we get a completely different visualization of the map. Um, I can also go to style and change between the low radius and the high radius. So I can bump up the high radius a little bit. I can say 30. Uh, and we now get a nice, nice visualization that indicates, you know, where do we have uh, the highest number of cases or visits or death or whatever you want to be looking at like this. Yeah. All right. Um, another major improvement is what we call the event data table. So we do have a data table for thematic maps. Um, we also now have it for event maps. So let me just super quick uh, show you how that works. So we can go now to the layers. Uh, we can build a event map. Uh, we can say program. Uh, we can select the in, inpatient uh, mobility mortality program. We can zoom in um, like this. Um, and then we zoom in, we can also come here and say, okay, I would like to show the data table. So now we get a data table uh, that lists the different underlying events uh, for this map. And you can, of course, filter uh, on it like we can for the, for the uh, data tables that we have for other types of, types of maps. Okay, um, no data handling. So we can now display no data better than we could before. Uh, in the series item, you can explicitly now select the color that you would like to use for, for no data. Previously, we just didn't display anything for no data, which made the, the chart look very incomplete. Um, we also have non-overlapping labels, which essentially means the labels don't look very sort of messy anymore. Uh, before the labels, if you had a facility layer, very often were rendered on top of each other, making it more or less useless to see the names. Um, we now have much more intelligent rendering of the labels so that uh, they don't conflict and don't are, they're not overlapping uh, anymore. Um, we do have an event status filter. So if you come to the event layer, um, there's now a filter for the, the um, status of the event. So going back to this one, 
there's now a event status filter here. So we can say all active completed schedule will be skipped and so forth for the different statuses. Uh, we talked about WebGL and map performance. Uh, we're using WebGL. Things are, are loading a lot faster now than, than before. We can load a lot more uh, sort of geographical features on a map compared to before. Uh, donut charts for map clusters is another one. There's a lot of goodies here in the in events, as you can see. So we can now load, uh, render um, events uh, as donut charts, as opposed to just a um, sort of one color point. So, so let me show you. Let me show you how this works very quickly. We can hide the, this one. If we go to style, uh, we can now say style by data element. So I can say, okay, I would like to style by gender, for instance. I get the colors that I can style by, and I can update. Um, and as you can see now, the the map is rendered now using pies or donuts as opposed to just uh, individual sort of single color points. This is quite nice because now we can read more out of the data. We can look at distribution both between gender, between age groups, uh, between different types of data elements and so forth um, and display essentially more information on the map, make a more telling map than before. Okay, we can rotate the, the map <laughs> if you want. If you press control and drag, uh, we can even now rotate the, the map. You can try this out yourself. Um, splitting map views is a nice one. I have to show you this one too. So instead of just displaying one map at a time, we can now render uh, multiple time periods using a, the same screen. So let me go back here and reopen um, a chart. Sorry, not the chart, but the map. <coughs> and as you can see here now, we have one map. One map. Uh, this is for, for last year. So I cannot go in here and edit. I can go to periods. I can say, instead of saying this year, I can say, I would like to look at the last six months. Um, that gives me the option under display period to say, okay, I would like to now show it as split maps. So I can split the map into multiple views. Uh, when I click updates, this now renders it as six different maps. So we can easily now see all of the um, time periods for the last six months in the same screen. And we can see the sort of evolution of how things have evolved over time. Um, talking about the uh, display periods, we also have now timeline charts. This is also quite cool, where we can essentially um, show the map as a video, as a timeline, where we can sort of visualize the evolution of the data over time. So by selecting timeline, I guess this nice little YouTube-ish uh, play uh, button down here. And I can decide to click play. As you can see, we have March, April, May. So this is the timeline coming down here. I can click play. Uh, and this is now gonna show me the, the different maps uh, on a timeline like this. Yeah, it's quite cool. All right. Um, multiple filters, we also added the ability to have multiple filters. So if you go into the filter tab in the uh, layer dialog, you will see that we can have any number of filters now. Uh, before you can, you, I think you can only have one filter, uh, but now there's any number of filters that can be applied to a map. All right, so I think that's, that concludes the uh, part where we talk about the front-end analytics. Uh, a lot of exciting updates, as you can see. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. And as, as mentioned, you can ask them in Slack or in, in Zoom or in the community of practice. Uh, and we will try to answer some of them later in some of them uh, right now. So talking a little bit about the backend or admin side of things, uh, we did something what we consider very important now in, in 234. Um, where we introduced what we call the server-side analytics cache. Um, so we have seen that um, a lot of implementations are getting a lot of data now. Uh, the data volume is growing. There's more and more requests. And we have seen that more and more data is pounding the analytics API. And, and there's a need for faster uh, rendering of, of responses. So what they did was to introduce what they call analytics cache on the server side. Um, we do already have caching of analytics in the client side, so that the web browser will cache the data. Uh, but from 234, we have the ability to cache data on the, on the back end as well. And this really helps because now multiple clients can essentially use the same cache. So the cache hit ratio goes up quite a bit. And we have seen dramatic improvements on instances that use this. Um, so we really recommend people to enable it. Um, another thing is that this is now security enabled. Uh, previously, people have set up caching through Nginx by adding uh, a header in, in Nginx and a, and a cache directive. 
the problem there is that Nginx sits in front of Tomcat, meaning that people can guess the URL and get sensitive data straight from, from Nginx. So this cache instead uh, sits sort of behind the DHS2 security layer, meaning that the cache is security enabled uh, and security is as good as before. Um, this one is linked now to the system setting called cache category. So there's nothing you need to do. Uh, the only thing you need to do is to go to the system settings and go to the cache strategy setting uh, and enable caching there. Either, you know, a couple of hours, next morning, two weeks, up to you. But this is now integrated with the system setting uh, and there's nothing you need to do. So we strongly recommend people to enable some, some caching at least if you, have a, if you have a business system. Okay, so let's go over a little bit to uh, talk about uh, tracker and events. So in Tracker, uh, there's also been a lot of improvements, especially in the new uh, capture application that we have. So one major change that we did in the, sort of both in the system and the data model for 234 or three, uh, was to allow <clears throat> assignment of events to users. So we have seen a number of use cases where people would like to associate users to events. So one example would be, you know, like a, like a, um, um, something that people have to go out and spray, for instance, in, in malaria, where it's important to assign uh, a task that to be done to some user or some person that's part of the team, right? So one example would be a malaria spraying campaign where, where um, you know, a, a household needs to be sprayed and then a certain team or person is assigned that task. So what we can do here is to essentially assign an event to a DHS2 user. So in the, in the capture application, there's now an assignee, uh, dialogue where you can come and, and assign one particular event to a user within within the HST. Um, we also added the ability to save event filters. So if you look in the capture application, uh, there's now the ability to have lists of events. Uh, some people call it working lists. The ability to set up, you know, essentially to-do lists for activity or tasks for people to complete. Um, so what you can do now, you can go to capture, you can make a filter uh, using some of the columns. And then when you're happy, you can save it uh, as a saved filter and then share it with people. So we have the same sharing paradigm linked to these filters as we have for, for metadata. So this should be familiar stuff. So essentially now you can save a filter uh, and then you can assign it to, to somebody uh, in the system, into a user in the system. Um, program rules have also undergone a lot of improvements. Um, and we know that sometimes program rules can be a little bit brittle. Sometimes they can break a little bit hard sometimes to know exactly what to, to use in the, in the, in the rules. Uh, and we added validation for, for program rules now so that if you try to enter, let's say a variable that doesn't exist or create some criteria where the element doesn't exist, uh, then the system is gonna complain before uh, runtime essentially. So we, we, we can validate this up front. Uh, as opposed to waiting for someone to use it and then and then have, have it break. So validation of program rules up front there. <clears throat> when it comes to performance, um, we have seen that this is also becoming a, a major and very important aspect of the system. And we have seen that the, the, the amount of events are growing. And we have seen to, to some extent that the, the, the previous um, event importer hasn't really catch up with, with the requirements for performance. So in 235, we've spent a lot of time on improving the performance of the event importer. Uh, it, the whole thing is entirely rewritten from scratch and is now a lot faster than it used to be. So in 235, we have a lot better performance when it comes to event import. Um, in an unofficial test, we, we have seen that it's more than three times faster than it used to be. Um, and also the concurrency is a lot better. You can have a lot more concurrent requests, meaning users uh, sending events at the same time than before. And we have now tested with more than 100 users sending data at the same time concurrently to the API. And the API is holding up. So, so a lot of work into, has gone into the event um, performance. We're also working now on making the tracker importer much, much faster. And um, re we really hope to have a new version of that available for 236. So performance is really a high, high priority for us as a team. Um, we also made a lot of improvements around user privacy. Um, as some of you might have noticed, um, DSS2 has been a little bit too liberal when it comes to exposing user information to, to regular users. So when it comes to like non-admin users, we have seen that some of them can see too much user information uh, compared to what, what, what people 
consider good privacy. So in 235, we have uh, added a lot of restrictions on the user endpoints. So that's, it's now not possible for non-admin users to go in and view user information. Um, essentially, we have made a new user API that gives you very limited information, um, which is open. And then we have been now protecting the, the full user API and the user part of metadata through the view user authority, meaning that you can now decide to protect the, your user information much better by not granting the view user authority to sort of end users. Like, and with end users, I mean people that are not user managers or administrators. So what I mean, what I'm saying here is essentially we're locking down the user information to the system to privileged users. Only. Okay. Um, we also did so back a little bit to sysadmin uh, things. So we also have done a lot of improvements when it comes to application monitoring. So we have introduced a new endpoint that now exposes application uh, and, and monitoring data. So this is based on what we call Prometheus. Prometheus is a very popular open source monitoring tool that is freely available to everyone. Uh, and we also recommend people to use Grafana, which is a very popular sort of uh, visualization tool on top of Prometheus. So we now have monitoring APIs that expose metrics that anyone can come and pull from or scrape as it's called. Uh, and this includes memory data, CPU information, uh, API information about APIs, like which APIs are most used, uh, most frequently used, which take the longest time and so on and so on. Uh, and this is of course very helpful for admins to, to look at bottlenecks uh, in, in, the, in the application. Um, if you're interested in this, you can read more in the sysadmin documentation uh, where we have written up this in length. So some of the examples, as you can see here, would be uh, the JVM monitoring. So we can see here uptime, start time, heap used, non-heap used. Uh, web API monitoring, where we can look at the different API endpoints and which take long time, uh, which are failing, uh, and which are not behaving, and, and so forth and so forth. So again, this can be very helpful for, for sysadmins. Um, when it comes to tracker, uh, we're trying to be compliant and we're trying to, to make, you know, comply essentially with regulation out there and very essential in a lot of the sort of regulation that we see uh, in countries is the ability to do audits of the system so in this case audit essentially means the ability to go back and look at what has happened in the system such as uh, who read certain data when was you know people um, injected into the system when were people information personal information changed when were personal information removed uh, who looked at the data and so on. So to cater for this, we have implemented a new uh, audit solution that supports everything from tracker, uh, aggregate data, and also metadata changes in the system. Um, this new solution is based on uh, a messaging queue called ActiveMQ, um, Artemis, which is nice in a way that it allows for other systems to also plug into this. So if you have a custom need for, for auditing, uh, you can now write kind of a wrapper and connect to the Artemis queue, and that way uh, come up with your own uh, sort of solution around this that might, might meet your needs. Um, by, you can enable and disable this in, in dshats.conf, of course. Um, and by default, it writes to the dsha2 database. So it writes records for audits to the database. Um, you can also configure it to, <clears throat> to write to logs. So you can also write to the log file. But again, the nice thing here is that um, since Artemis is kind of an open source, well-known uh, messaging queue, it's also easy to plug in your own solution if you have very specific need for audits. So this would be helpful for, to meet regulation from, from governments uh, in different countries out there. Um, continuing on Tracker, um, we have a lot of functionality now around sending and scheduling of messages. So we have for a long time been able to send messages um, for a program on a routine basis. What's new in 234 is the ability to send messages based on program rules uh, and conditions within program rules. So you can essentially build program rule expressions that as the action allows you to send a message. Um, and the message can be sent immediately uh, or it can be scheduled to be run uh, or sent at a later stage. It's based on messaging templates and allows you to customize the text and the content of these, these messages. Um, so, so this is useful, of course, for many different uh, scenarios and use cases. Uh, one would be to send messages for positive malaria tests, for instance. You can send a message to, to the relevant people, uh, or you can schedule a reminder for anemic women when you do antenatal care and so forth. So again, 
this allows you this provides for more flexibility uh, more configurability in and more kind of fine-grained control over when and if to send messages um, all right so moving over to the platform aspect of things and i can see they're running a bit uh, later so we need to speed up <laughs> a little bit uh, the platform team has done a lot of work uh, of the last year um, in 235 we're coming up with a new sms configuration app so the previous app was kind of starting to look a bit dated or very dated uh, we now have a completely new version of the app coming out in, in 235 um, and it has the sort of the fresh new look and feel. It's based on the new technology, the new React and the new app platform that we are building. Um, and it allows you to, to set up, you know, commands. It allows you to set, um, look at received messages, send messages, and pretty much everything that the previous mobile app was doing. So the previous app was called Mobile Configuration. Uh, that one is going to be phased out probably in 236. Um, and this is basically is superseded by the new SMS app, which is focused around SMS um, configuration, SMS setup. Um, the input export app is completely rewritten. Uh, it contains more or less the same functionality as the previous one, but uh, it has a lot of sort of new, nice looking UI, which is easier to use and has a more attractive look than the previous one. So input export app in 235 completely rewritten uh, and contains, um, you know, user-friendly, nice, nice UI that you can use to import export. We now also support uh, both data import, data export, metadata import, metadata export, uh, tracked into the instance export is being included and so forth. So we're, we're trying to now cover more of the features in the API in the new app. Yeah, this is the event import screen, as you can see here. Okay, so a little bit about deployment. Um, so in 235, uh, we will slowly introduce kind of a larger change to how we deploy and release VHS2. So as all of you know, like up to now, we have uh, six monthly releases of VHS2, uh, where essentially all the apps and the backend and everything is released every six months. What we have seen is that we would like a little bit more flexibility, a bit more agility in the way we release VHS2 because we have seen that um, sometimes, you know, we have improvements in, in a certain app uh, and we don't really want to wait, you know, six more months before it can be released. We sometimes would like to deploy and make those apps available more quickly. So we are now slowly shifting towards releasing the web applications, the front end applications on a monthly or six month or six weekly uh, cadence. So the point here is that the front end applications will be released much more frequently uh, while we will keep the release schedule for the backend or API uh, software. So the backend will continue to be released as a, as a six monthly uh, cadence, while the apps will be start to be released on a monthly cadence. Um, and this has a few consequences. So first of all, uh, we now plan to deploy all our apps, not just sort of third party apps, but also the core digital applications to the DHS2 app hub. Um, so <clears throat> we do want to deploy all of the apps to the app hub um, and we will deploy sort of the monthly released apps into the app hub. We will probably continue to release kind of the full bundle every six months. So people that, you know, basically would like it to keep, keep it as it is today, they will also be, um, you know, accommodated here. But the thing is like once we release a monthly version of an app to the app hub, it will be possible to override the core app. So the, the consequence of this is that if you're sitting on DHS2, uh, and you would like to receive the latest features of, let's say, the dashboard or the visualizer, you can actually decide to say, okay, I would like to get the new version of the dashboard, but I don't want to upgrade everything else because we know that upgrading everything has a cost. You need to retrain people. You need to test everything. You need to stop your server. There's downtime. You need to migrate, uh, and you might not want to do that very often. So this essentially allows you to just take the latest and the greatest when it comes to some of the apps, <clears throat> but still maintain on the same backend version as you are. So just to repeat, this is nice because it gives you faster access to new features. You don't have to wait, you know, for, for six months or a year to get a, to get a new feature. You don't have to upgrade um, everything to receive it. Uh, and of course, also, if there's a bug somewhere in some app, <clears throat> you can now choose to receive the bug fix just for that app without upgrading everything else. So just as an example, uh, if you decide to install DSHA 235 in October, then in September, there's a new 
release of the Visualizer app, you can now choose to just download the Visualizer app and remain on the same sort of overall version. <coughs> Um, continuing with the sysadmin part, we also have horizontal scaling now with DHS2. Uh, some of you notice we have the ability to load DHS2 now in a cluster, meaning we can have multiple Tomcats and multiple web servers serving the same application. Uh, and we've used this now for quite some time, uh, and especially for, for PEPFAR. I know the South Africans also have used this for a while. Um, it really has had great uh, effects. We haven't really seen any down, downtime since we introduced this. Uh, where we essentially have multiple application servers serving the same uh, DHS2 instance. So this will allow you to, to deal with more users, more data. It, will, it means less downtime. Um, you can now have what we call high availability, where if one server go down, uh, we have other servers taking over. Um, and of course, this is um, well documented in the sysadmin guide. So if you go there, you can read more about this. Yeah, security is an ongoing effort. Like we have done a lot of work on security over the last year. Um, we have received uh, very detailed, high quality pen tests from different organizations over the last year, which we are very happy for and very sort of thankful for. Um, we also have uh, finally had the opportunity to hire a, a dedicated security engineer, which has given us the chance to do a lot of security fixes. Uh, and we have seen now that there's been a lot of fixes, uh, a lot of improvements when it comes to security in, in DHS2. All right, so I think, I think um, with that, we have about um, nine minutes left. So I think we'll, we'll pause there and I think we will see if there's any questions uh, that have come up so far. So Scott, if you wanna take it over, feel free. Great, thanks Lars. I actually learned a lot about, about DHS too in that session as well. Uh, there has been a few questions. Um, one topic that's been uh, quite a few questions on in the COP is on the dashboard filters. A few folks seem like they may have been a little bit confused about how the dashboard filters carry through user permissions. And just to make sure that everybody understands that if a user is assigned not to the national level or uh, to the highest level, maybe they're assigned to a district level or a state level to, uh, for data entry and data view, then on the dashboard filter in the org unit selection, that's the highest level they will see. The dashboard filter does not override the user settings or the user permissions. It carries through those, just to make that clear. Um, Lars, there was also another question here about um, being able to integrate multiple DHIS2 databases and view uh, all the data on a single dashboard. Do you have any thoughts on that? You're muted, Lars. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So the question was uh, to integrate multiple instances of DHS2. Yes. And to be able to view all of that data onto one dashboard, kind of operationally, how can that be done? Yeah. So that's a good question. And I think to that, there's no kind of magic answer to that. Um, I would say your best option right now would be simply to do integration of those two instances, either into one of them or into a, a kind of common shared instance. Um, there, there's no way that the dashboard can sort of go outside the DHS2 instance that it's linked to and, and look for data. It, it basically looks for data in this DHS2 instance. So what I would recommend then is that you, you decide either to integrate you know, one of them into the other or that you set up a third instance where you essentially have you know, kind of a portal view or an overall view. Um, and the best way would be that in, in that case, you need to set up data elements uh, that match, you know, the other side, and then you need to exchange data between them so that you take the data that you, that you like to visualize over to the other instance. That, that would be the only option right now. Okay, great. Thank you. One, there is quite a lot of interest on the continuous analytics. So two questions on that. And I think these are the last two questions we have time for then. Um, what are the downsides, if any, of using continuous analytics? And how does continuous analytics and server-side caching interact together? Those are excellent questions. Um, so the first one, uh, in terms of the downsides, the, there isn't really a lot of downsides. Um, the only limited, the only kind of impact will be that will be a little bit more load on your server. Um, so we do recommend that if you want to run continuous analytics, you should bump up your server spec a little, a little bit. Like you should have a little bit more CPU, a little bit more RAM, um, and so forth. Make sure you have a fast disk. That is the only implication, so you can sort of handle the increased load. The, the load isn't that much. It's 
much less than it used to be if you try to run kind of the full analytics during the day, uh, but there is a little bit. So just make sure you don't have an underspect server. Um, the other question was about um, caching and continuous analytics. That's an excellent job uh, question. And the answer is we don't really have any intelligence there right now. So I think the question was really like, how can we make sure that the frequency of the analytics job doesn't override uh, or kind of collide with the cache? Um, and unfortunately right now, I mean, if you go to analytics, there's a system setting called cache strategy. It's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour until 6 a.m. next morning or two weeks. And we could think of a solution where you say, okay, cache until the continuous analytics table job runs again, right? So you cache for like 10 minutes until it runs. Those types of more intelligent caching, we can definitely look into. Uh, I like that suggestion. We don't support it right now. So up for, so for now, you need to, to make sure that you keep these things relatively in sync, right? So if your analytics table job takes 15 minutes, you, you put the cache on 15 minutes. That won't be perfect, but that, that will be, I would say, good enough for now. Okay, thanks. I think that's all the time we have. I'll stay on the community practice and keep answering the questions that anyone has coming through, but I guess we hand it back over to Max now.